Well, good evening, good evening. Get your hymn books and turn to number 426. 426. <laughs> Was everybody well tonight? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're here and not in the hospital or jail. That's that's a good thing. So so let's sing it now. Put some life into this one, okay? Because you can't sing this dead. This is Governor 426. Here we go. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sin of earth be set on every hand. Doubt and fear and doubt of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall I'm drinking from the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Bula land, far below the storm of doubt upon Sons of men in battle long the enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me, tis the land. I'm living on the mountain. Manna from a body full 
168, a good reminder song, 368. <laughs> Good evening. Just want to make a couple announcements. Remind you tomorrow, Sunny Saints, 1130. Uh, good food, good fellowship, and have a, a video focusing on the, uh, the imminent return of Christ. What a thought that is. Looking forward to that. Then Friday, Taste of Italy. A lot of work's gone into that. And I tell you, if, you, uh, you've been the whole, if you're going on a diet, postpone it this week. We just forget that until uh, next month or something. But uh, tomorrow night, Italian dinner, and then after that, a dessert auction. And uh, Barry's not here tonight, so I, I just there's a key, there's a little trick we can play. Barry is committed to buying his own wife's cake um, Friday night. So just if he says 50, we say 60. He says 80, we say 90, because he's got to go up. He's got to go up. So we. <laughs> so if he yeah if he swipes out of that thing, uh, we say 250. Oh, sold. What? You <laughs> know, whoops. So. Oh, yeah, he's, he's not watching tonight. We can get away with that. So. so don't forget, that is Friday. And then Saturday is, what's going on Saturday? Men's Prayer Breakfast. Somebody said that wasn't in the bulletin. Is that true? It was in the bulletin, wasn't it? I think it was. I th- 
Uh, I think it was in the bulletin. Somebody told me, you didn't announce it. It's not in the bulletin. I didn't announce it, I know, but I think it was in the bulletin. Anybody? I think it was too. So that may be that may be somebody being wrong for the first time. It was in there, right? Good. I love it when I'm right. That, that happens so <laughs> <laughs> happens so infrequently. So anyway, so so tomorrow, Sunny Saints, Thursday, Italian Taste of Italy, and uh, then Saturday, men's prayer breakfast, and Sunday. Don't forget Sunday. I'm uh, looking forward to worshiping together with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the good music that's already been sung and played. Thank you how it lifts our hearts and points our our minds to you, and thank you again for the opportunities this week of the ministry, times of fellowship, and times, Lord, just to get together as a church, enjoy one another, and thank you for all the work that's gone into every every ministry, every aspect. Pray that you would um, help us to grow in our faith with you through that. Pray bless again tonight, bless our children, the teens, and uh, bless the ones that are away. Give them safety as they travel as well. In your name we pray. Amen. As we're singing 367, I want you to carefully Watch the words as we go through every one of these verses. There's some tremendous, tremendous writing in, in, this, in this song, Jesus Took My Burden. 367, let's sing it. <clears throat> when I, a poor lost sinner, before the Lord did fall, and in the name of Jesus for pardon loud did call. He heard my supplication, and soon the weak was strong. For Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. Yes, Jesus took my burden, I could no longer bear. Yes, Jesus took my burden in answer to my prayer. My anxious fear subsided, my spirit was made strong, for Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. Oft times the way is dreary and rugged seems the road, oft times I'm weak and weary when bent beneath thy load. But when I cry in weakness, how long, O oh Lord, how long? Then Jesus takes my burden and leaves me with the song. Yes, Jesus took my burden, I could no longer bear. Yes, Jesus took my burden in answer to my prayer. My anxious fear subsided. My spirit was made strong, for Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. When I was crushed with sorrow, I bowed in deep despair. My load of grief and heartache seemed more than I could bear. Was then I heard a whisper, you to the Lord belong. My burden and left me with the song. Yes, Jesus took my burden, I could no longer bear. Yes, Jesus took my burden in answer to my prayer. My anxious fear subsided, my spirit was made strong. For Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. I'll trust him for the future, he knoweth all the way. For him his eyes he'll guide me along life's pilgrim way. And I will tell in heaven while ages roll along. For Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. Yes, Jesus took my burden. I could no longer bear. Yes, Jesus took my burden in answer to my prayer. My anxious fear subsided. My spirit was made strong. For Jesus took my burden and left me with the song. Go 
to 1 Samuel chapter 2. I hope you've had a good day today. I had a chance to go hear Silas uh, compete in his uh, high school preaching competition up at BJ today. And I think there are about eight. Is that right, Tamla? About eight that were seven or eight? There were seven in that room and seven in another. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the, there were 14 okay. in that, that one. Then. So uh, Silas did a good job and... Uh, it's, it's unusual to, to, to be preaching to judges, you know, it's like, you know, that's, I mean, everybody kind of is that, but, you know, but uh, he did a good job, so had a good time, I'm sure. He was the only competitor that made it to nationals from, from his school, so that was exciting. There was kids there from Danville, Illinois, from Topeka, Kansas, from um, Rio Grande, New Jersey. Did you know there's such a thing as Rio Grande, New Jersey? Did you know that? <laughs> Rio Grande. Okay. We need to close that border. That's all I'm saying. That's, we gotta, uh, keep, keep the New Jerseyans out of here. That, that's what. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. I'm in trouble now, probably. Yeah, I'm going to be in trouble now. Um, reading through my Bible every year. You know, that, I don't know how many times I've done this. Um, Something always strikes me as, you know, it's like, oh, look at it, just being reminded of something, and maybe I knew it before I forgot it, but maybe I didn't know it. Uh, sometimes you see something in front of you. But as I go through 1 Samuel, I am struck by 1 Samuel chapter 2, because here is Hannah's prayer, and it is a jewel that stands out, and really it influences generations, generations to come. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I want to read the first 10 verses here. And this is Hannah and her prayer. 1 Samuel 2 verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she, hath, she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor, and maketh rich. He bringeth low, and he lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up, up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Those are more verses than we have of a lot of different Bible characters. We know more about this lady's prayer. And really, this we know chapter 1, kind of her background. And here's this prayer, and then she slips away into obscurity. Really, I guess we know nothing else about this lady. It's amazing to me. In fact, um, as I was thinking about this prayer, I was thinking, you know, what was the qualifications for this lady? And what, what qualifies her to make this prayer? Um, who was this woman? Well, chapter 1, verse 19. Well, um, verse, um, verse 1 of chapter 1. There, there was a certain man of Ramath, Zophim. Ramathiam Zophim of Mount Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. So we have that, that this town, um, verse 19 of chapter 1, uh, it says, And they rose in the morning and uh, in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. So, so she's from Ramah. There's a, a larger name for that uh, in verse 1 there. But she lived in Ramah. Uh, what, is, what is that? Uh, it's a town given to the Levites about five miles north of Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, not really anything spectacular about that place. We know from chapter 1 she was a childless wife or a, she had, she, a barren wife. She was not able to have children. And then 
uncomfortable for us, and, and we wonder, how in the world is this possible? And allow? She was one of two wives. Uh, you say, that is strange. Now, Deuteronomy 21 allowed for this in certain cases, but this was never God's plan, and it always caused problems. Uh, so, you, know, you look at this and say, this lady, who is this lady that's qualified for this prayer? Who is this one? Where, when did she live? Well, uh, let's go back to the book of Judges, because some, is sometime this happened uh, between Judges and Saul, you know, that, that's, this is the time where she lived. Look at this last, um, let's see, what is it? Um, Judges chapter 19, we have a mention of her town here. And there's a story associated with this town. Judges 19 is in the middle of one of the darkest sections in the Bible. I remember the first time I read through the Bible, I think I was a fifth or sixth grader, and I was, my stomach got sick. Still as an adult as I read this. Um, there was a lot of things that I did not know about in the world. I was a sheltered kid, and reading my Bible, I'm thinking, what is going on here? This is, there's violence, there's depravity, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. But look in chapter 19 here, in verses 10 through 13, it says, But the man would not tear, this is the traveler that's going through, you know, he, his, his concubine had ran away from home, and she was promiscuous. He goes to get her, so he's coming back with her, okay? So, but the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus. What is, what's that? That's the ancient town of Jerusalem. The Jebusites were there, so this is the region. The, David hadn't conquered it yet, so it was, it was non-Jewish. These were the Canaanite people that lived there. So he's near there, which, it, well, it says, which is Jerusalem? Yeah, so you, <laughs> there's the answer right there. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. This is the closest city. Let's go in there. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger. That is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah, and he said unto, unto, by the way, Gibeah is Saul's hometown. Uh, you remember that a uh, little bit later. And he said unto his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. So there's our, t our town of Ramah where Hannah was from. And if you know anything about this story, I'm not going to go into the graphic details there, but because of the debauchery and the violence, Israel rose up against this city, and the tribe of Benjamin says, we're defending our own. They said, you're, you're going to put up with this? Yeah, we're putting up with this. In fact, you better not step foot in here. We're going to have a battle. I said, okay, we're going to have a war. And so 11 tribes came after Benjamin because of this. And you remember, um, they prayed and asked the Lord, and the first day they lost. The Benjamites were victorious. The second day, they, they mourned and prayed and sacrificed and said, you said, Lord, who should go up the next day? And, and the next day, they lost. And the third day they said, Lord, I, you know, what's going on here? You're telling us to go. And then the third day they won, and they, were, they had righteous indignation. They, they, were, they defeated the Benjamites so much that they were fleeing. They were killing as many as they could, and only 600 survived. And then they realized that the anger settled down. They said, we almost wiped out a whole tribe of Israel. And so these, they, they had pledged not to give their wives to these men, and so now they're stuck. What are we going to do? Uh, if these men of war don't have children, then guess what? One generation later, there will be no tribe of Benjamin. So they said, what can we do? And does, who remembers the solution of this? Yeah, they, they, there's a group of people that hadn't gone up. Uh, no, no, actually, they, they cast lots. And, and, and no, they, the ones that didn't go up, they went and destroyed them too. So there was a group, they, they determined, we are not going to give wives to these, to these men. So they started thinking, they said, there's a festival, a yearly festival where the virgins come out and dance and I tell you what, we'll go tell the Benjamites to come and without asking permission, you just hide out in the woods and you come and, and if you see a beautiful woman, you just go and grab her and take her off to the wilderness. Now, that sounds like seven brides for seven brothers, doesn't it? That sounds like that. You know? just, oh, man. Now, you th I, this is wild times, is it not? This is wild. I mean, I mean, and then when the men are all upset and saying, wait, who came and stole our daughters? They say, listen, listen, you didn't do it on purpose. You didn't give them to your, you know, didn't give your, your, daughter, your daughters to wife to them, so you're safe from your vow. But this is what happened. Now, I tried to put a time frame on this. When did this happen in Judges 19? Because this is at the end, and we're looking at the town of Ramah, where Hannah lives. And I thought, is there a connection there? 
And uh, getting into the timeline there, um, Ryrie has a timeline that says Samson was the last judge chronologically, and Samuel was actually born during the lifetime of Samson. So this story of the Benjamite War happened earlier in the time frame. Now, I, I don't know if there's other timelines. I just looked at one timeline today. But it made me wonder, did Hannah's mom or grandmother, was she one of those women that, that was snatched and taken off to be a bride? I don't know. I don't know. It may be, maybe that's something I don't know about and that you say, no, Pastor, don't you know this? And that would debunk that. But I started thinking about that. That is a very interesting situation here. Here's a lady growing up in Ramah, or at least her husband's in Ramah there. She's living there, and she is praying. So who is this lady that's bringing this prayer? We don't know her qualifications here. We don't know much about her. What was her theological background? You know, what... what um, where did, how did she know God's promises? You know, where did she go to Bible college? You know, how, does, how did she know the theology that she is sharing in her prayer there? There's a lot of mystery here. But one thing that I do know is we don't have to have a theological degree to come to God in prayer. We don't know a lot about this lady, but we do have to believe. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Like, Hannah is a, is a shining jewel of, of theology displayed and affecting her life and how the joys that she experienced because of that. And she says some things that really points to the Messiah. What a thought this is. You don't know much about her, but you don't have to have qualifications to come to God in prayer. She loved God, she loved his word, and she, she uh, reached out to him. So there's the, the qualifications for prayer. Um, let's look at the prelude for prayer. Um, so, uh, 1 Samuel 2 is a prayer of rejoicing. She is exuberant. But it didn't start out that way. Look back in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 10. She comes to the, to the, to the tabernacle and, sh and says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Before her prayer of rejoicing in chapter 2, she's got a prayer of bitterness, and she is, she is in, in the depths of despair and, and just pouring her heart out. Bitter means just, it's, just, it's, it's painful, it's, it's, it's not good, and she pours her heart out to him. 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. Now, you know what that tells me? Eli had seen several other women that were probably drunk coming to the tabernacle too. I mean, you know what Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were doing? And you think about the wickedness that was spread around, he probably thought, here's another one. Maybe that's what he thought. You know, here's another one. Uh, because I, this probably wasn't the first time he saw this. I mean, that's speculation here. But he's like, oh, here you go. You've been, you've been drinking again. And Eli said to her, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter Belial for... For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So the prelude to her joy was deep sorrow that she shared with the Lord. She poured out her complaint. Again, here is honest prayer. This is not a, oh, thou Lord, you know, come to you today. You know, it, it, some people have prayer voices. You know, they, 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 they go, slip into an altar persona to pray. She's just being honest and saying, Lord, this is, I'm having a rough time. This I'm in, I'm in, I, <laughs> things are not going well. And every day, day in and out, there's no relief. Now, she made a vow to the Lord, but this does not guarantee God's will. She didn't, as a sense, cut a deal with God. This is, say, Lord, you know, you don't have to do this, but if you do, I want to give him back to you. But she was earnest with God. She was honest with God, and she was humble. You know, praying in the tabernacle, she didn't care what other people thought. That takes humility, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes we don't want to share our emotions or you know, let, our, let our, our facade down, I guess. But here she is just humbly and honestly praying to the Lord. So that's the prelude. But then we come to chapter 2. Here is the, the, the prayer of rejoicing. 
Notice here, it's the joy of one who worships God supremely. His will is the most important thing in her life. And you can see that clearly as she rejoices in the Lord and she goes through this. His gracious granting of a request. You know, uh, she is thrilled that God listened to her. He doesn't have to, but he chose to do that. It's not entitlement. It's not, you know, protesting and, and, and picketing outside the walls of, of, of heaven to get your way. And then finally, yes, I demanded my way. I got it. It's a humble uh, uh, request. And she's very thankful for his gracious granting the other request. Uh, now, uh, notice what it says here. That I want to read um, a couple, several sentences here of a commentator here talking about the joy she had in God answering her prayer. She says, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord. The feeling that was so rapturous was the sense of God's gracious owning of her. His taking her into partnership, so to speak, with himself. His accepting of her son as an instrument for carrying out his gracious purpose to Israel and to the world. Only those who have experienced it can understand the overwhelming blessedness of this feeling that the infinite God should draw near to a sinful creature and not only accept him but identify himself with him as it were taking him and those dearest to him into his confidence and using them to carry out his plans. It's something almost too wonderful for the human spirit to bear. That God would use her son. Boy, she was, she was overjoyed with that. But notice here, it's almost a prayer of vindication here. It says, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. He's the one whom she trusted. Then it says, My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. That's what it says, um, verse, verse number one there. My, my, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Who were her enemies? The other wife. Now, you say, how bad was it? How bad was it getting? It was pretty bad. In fact, let's look back at this. Um, look at chapter 1, verse 6. And her adversary. Uh, that's someone who wants to oppose you. If you want to go left, they want to go right. If, if uh, you want to get chocolate ice cream, they want to get vanilla ice cream. <laughs> just whatever you want, they want something different. Just to, just, to, just to be the adversary there. Her adversary also provoked her sore. For to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. I like that word fret. Yeah, fret not. But what does that mean, fret? What, what does it mean to fret? Okay, is it something small or is it something big? It's something big. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is a big deal here. In fact, let me, let me say, I wrote down the, the definition. To be violently agitated. Uh, it, it means to make somebody thunder, like a clap of thunder. You know, I mean, have you ever go to somebody and, and just poked them and poked them, and all of a sudden they just lost and just, ah, I just can't, you know, that, that, you made them fret. <laughs> okay, and if a junior high boy does it, like, yes, I did it. Yes, that's so, yeah, that's so exciting. That's their goal. But here is this adversary, this woman, every day. Now, notice what she was doing. What was she doing? In verse 6, what did, she, what did she say? For to make her fret, because the Lord has shut up her womb. Now, that's what the Lord had done, right? Because verse 5, it says, but the Lord had shut up her womb. But her adversary is saying that, you know? Hey, the Lord shut your womb. Hey, and, and, and do you think there's, again, I think I'm building on this, maybe building, it's, it's in the Hebrew somewhere if you study deep enough there. But what do you think she was adding to the fact of saying, hey, the Lord shut your, shut your womb up. The Lord has not allowed you to, not, the Lord has not allowed you to have children. What do you think the adversary was adding to that? Okay. Look at the children I have. You don't have any because the Lord did that to you. Exactly. Look at this. I've got a lot of children, and I love these children. And, and the Lord has shut your womb up, so what does that mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she probably, yeah, and probably, look, look at you. I mean, this, you know, look, I've produced children, you know, so God loves me more. My, our husband loves me more. I mean, you think about that. And do you, yeah, yeah, Bill? Well, if you look at the, uh, history of the Bible, you gave away a portion, but he loved half. 
Right. So I think that's another reason that other wife was really poking her. Oh, yeah. She yeah. was mad that she wasn't the favored wife, yeah. even though she had the children. Because that was what was important to the Hebrews. Right, right. So again, her adversary, she's saying, the Lord shut your womb up, so therefore, and I think she's supplying the why. Because have you ever wondered when we're going through tough times, we know the Lord's in control, but we think, why? Why, Lord? Well, here comes the adversary supplying those answers. I know why. I know why the Lord's not allowing you to go through that. You're Job's comforters, right? We know why you're going through a tough time. You've sinned. You know, you're a wicked guy. You know, you, God's punishing you. Or, you know, whatever the thing is. But they're using that beyond what we know. We know God has done it. But the adversary, I believe, was supplying all of the reasons why. And she was really, um, really going after her. What a thought that is. The temptation is her adversary voicing the worst about her. Maybe she was polite. I wonder why God doesn't allow you to bear a side. You must be under God's punishment. Why do you worship God, the God when He hasn't even allowed you to have children? I mean, what's it, what's it getting for you? You're serving the Lord. You worship God. And He's not letting you have any good things here. Why are you even worshiping Him? I mean, can you imagine? That? I mean, this is, this is the way the devil works, isn't it? And it's one thing to have the devil bring a temptation. It's another one to live with the person. You know, it's probably another tent. But Oh, I'm sorry, Evan. Yes, Evan. Perhaps Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I think it, it was broader. It was probably broader. There might have been, uh, again, I think there's a, there's a local context and a lar larger context. Do you have a suggestion for that? I don't. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. I, I think, um, ladies, please don't get mad at me for saying this, but sometimes when a lady is kind of bad-mouthing somebody, there's a group that gathers around. Am I, am I, am I don't, don't throw anything at me. Is that true? Is that true, you know? Uh, was it uh, pick a little tip, chip a little? What is that? What that that little song from the from the music yeah from the music man? Yeah, it's like you know they get together now. Maybe as a group of ladies, maybe she went every time she went down to the well. You know, here's the ladies that kind of have voiced it. Oh, here's this lady again. There, yeah. So maybe it's that, but also it, she's looking at the broader picture too. That now she's aligning herself with the Lord. So there's a lot more enemies against the Lord too. So anybody want to fight about anything I just said? Yeah. Yes, Warner. How do I get what about from the text? What you've been saying. The, the text just says that she provoked her severely and was miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Because I know how life works. I know how people are. And I'm not saying it has to be that way, but I say it's probably likely that way. Have you not been around people that just want to poke and, and just, just do that stuff? I know how the devil works too. I know how Job, his, his adversaries work. So I am pulling from, a, from life experience and also other examples of Scripture to say that might be how it happened. That's where I'm coming from. Okay? Any, anybody else? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Specifically says that, you know, that she is provoking her um, to make her fret. Yes. Because, I mean, the whole thing there, as far as I'm yeah, I, I know the devil can work in our life too. Say, you know what? You know, you're, you're supposed to be loving the Lord and he hasn't given you children because he, he's the one that shut your womb up there and that can be a lot of discouragement from that. Pastor, yes, yes. Nobody can provoke you like your family. And <laughs> nobody. <laughs> That's it's true. Thing of brothers and sisters that squabble. That's true. Nobody can hurt your feelings like your brothers and sisters. Yeah. And sisters are household. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it, it may not be a physical outburst, but there's, there's an em, emotional, yeah, yeah, emotional thing going on, yeah. It's not expressing it maybe outwardly, you know, getting it out. I get it out of my system. Boy, do I get it out of my system. <laughs> <laughs> when you're holding it in, you know, it, it does more harm that way, I think, than letting it blow up into somebody. Well, we need to talk. Yeah. I'm telling you, we need to talk. Yeah. Quietly. Oh, yeah, she's not an irritable person, but, but it's tearing her up. It, it's te yeah, it's tearing her up. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, she's not violent and aggressive and just spewing off. No. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's the future, too, because 
Raymond Tilly sent her to the husband. She yeah. had no one. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yes, sir. Somebody over here. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, you know, according to the text, she's she's spreading the upset. You're talking about she didn't express in anger; she expressed through weeping. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it says it <coughs> says that. So instead of raw, you know, she's yeah. weeping. You know, and even in the temple, yeah, and she can't speak. Yeah. So. Yeah. Chapter. You know, what does it say? One. One uh, says she's pouring out her bitter complaint. Verse sixteen. Out of the abundance of my complaining grief, have I spoken? Yeah, the abundance of that, yeah. Yeah. Phil? Yeah, I was going to say that nowhere in her prayer, that she read, did she blame God for anything. Right, right, right. Mm Mm-mm. Well, she knew it, just a man-child, just just have a baby, you know, that's what he knew. It it doesn't say, though. I don't think it's when he told her to go away. Okay, yeah, verse 17, okay. Hmm. Yeah. He believed her. He, when she told him the answer that she wasn't drunk, he obviously he believed that. He, yeah. he could see that. But yeah. His blessing then came right the next sentence out of his mouth. Yeah. No, it just says the Lord granted thy petition. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. In verse seventeen. Well, verse eleven says that he heard that. Yeah. Yeah, so she didn't say it out loud. You know, her lips are moving, yeah, so. Yeah, Eli didn't hear what she was saying. That's why he had to reject her. He didn't know what she was saying. On a side note, who do you think um, inscripturated this? Probably Samuel that wrote this down, probably. So um, maybe Hannah went home and, and wrote this down, or uh, somehow that this was preserved. Maybe Samuel grew up seeing this prayer. I don't, you know, I don't know. That's an interesting thought. So. Well, now we're going to get into the pr- <laughs> prayer. It's, the time is up. So the prayer is amazing. We're going to deal with this uh, next week. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's God-centered. It's God-focused. And she rejoices in who God is. And it's just, it's a humble submission to God. God does that. He, he brings people down. He raises them up. And uh, we see that, uh, that attitude mirrored by several other people in Scripture as well. So, Okay. Yes, sir. Gordon. I'll, I'll th- okay, here we go. go. Yeah. Okay, Kenny? I think about this, though, as this broken woman bow on her knees before the Lord, just making this simple request to him alone. Mm -hmm. And his response to that, he gives her one of the probably ten greatest men that's ever lived on this earth. Right. That was his answer back to this widow, mm-hmm. dear woman. I think that's what a, what a mighty God. You got Moses, um, Daniel, Abraham. You got to put him up there somewhere, oh, yeah. somewhere pretty close. Yeah. 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 Well. Wow. She also has five other children. Yes, yes. And Samuel went back to living with him at David. Interesting, yeah. I like to think yeah. that she's still living. Yeah, that, that's, a inter- that's an interesting thought. Yes, Phil. Yeah, oh yeah, the husband's, yeah, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to keep both of his wives happy. She, she knows that her husband is for her. Yeah, yeah. So that probably helped what the other wife had to say. Yeah, yeah. He says one of the dumbest things in Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> at the university. Am I not better to these than ten sons of God? Husbands try, you know, they do their best. They, they do their best. <laughs> so if it ever comes... If it comes to the wife, say, you want me to leave or you want your son to leave, that, then that, that's, you're in trouble, huh? So, well, thank you for your participation. I, we, got, I hope you're, we haven't got to the prayer yet. That's just the background of that, so just uh, get, gets us thinking there. So, Okay, um, are we off of the World Wide Web and all this kind of stuff? Okay, okay. I want to make